Hi Year 11, it's Mrs Reed, and welcome to Session 2, Revising GCSE English Language. This session will be looking at the similarities between Paper 1, Question 2 and Paper 2, Question 3. Okay, so first of all, I recommend that you uh, make sure you have the resources you need. So get yourself a pen and paper, get rid of any distractions, if that means putting your phone away or on silent. Um, and I recommend that you spend some time, first of all, laying your page out um, using Cornell Notes. And I would recommend that you use that um, structure for each of these revision sessions. Okay, so just to remind us very quickly then, when we're talking about English language paper one, um, we're talking uh, about answering the reading questions, four reading questions in total, um, on one fiction extract. So today we'll be talking about question two on that paper, which is worth eight marks. And when we're talking about paper two, um, this is a paper that asks you to look at two non-fiction extracts, again, four reading questions. Um, and we'll be looking at question three. Now, this one is worth 12 marks, and it will only ask you to answer on one of the two non-fiction extracts. Okay, so what links are there between the papers then? Well, I've chosen um, these two because there really are strong similarities in the type of question and in the style of your answer. So for paper one, question two, if we just look at um, the um, general structure of a question, you can see that you'll be guided to look um, at a particular area of the extract, to look at specific lines of the source, and then um, to say how the writer uses language here to, and that will be the last bit of that question that changes to a specific focus. So for example, how does the writer use language here to describe the weather? And they give you some guidance, what you could focus on. So um, the writer's choice of words and phrases, language features and techniques, um, or even sentence forms. And you can see actually in paper two, question three looks very similar. Um, they also ask you to refer to um, specific lines of one source and also to say how the writer uses language too. And again, they'll give you a specific focus. So it might be something like, um, how does the writer use language to describe a character, for example, such as um, Sister Brendan in one of the papers we've covered. This is the same question, um, but it's actually worth 12 marks. So in question, in paper one, you're looking at around about 10 minutes to get your eight marks. And in paper two, you have slightly longer, so around 14 minutes is a reasonable length of time to spend on this question. Okay, let's look at similarities then in the assessment objective. Well, both of these questions cover AO2, where you're asked to explain, comment on and analyse how writers use language and structure to achieve effects and influence readers using relevant subject terminology to support their views. So these are both analysis questions. They're asking you to focus closely on language and to explore layers of meaning and how these texts have been constructed to convey that meaning to their reader. So in other words, what do I need to do? Well, I need to have a good knowledge about language in order to answer these questions. A good knowledge about language, which means being able to label word classes, to be able to identify features of language such as metaphor, simile, personification. And I need to be able to examine this language close up. I need to be able to think about, well, how and why language is used in certain ways, and then how it might affect me in different ways, and then explore the effect that, that it creates. 
OK, so we can link the papers further through the kinds of devices and um, methods that the writers use. So I mentioned there that having a good knowledge of language is important for these questions. So perhaps refreshing um, word classes and um, the difference between figurative language um, forms such as metaphor, simile and personification is a really good um, revision strategy. If that's not something that you're immediately confident with, that's going to slow you down in the exam and I would really recommend that's something to an area to focus on. So you could talk about language features in, in both paper um, one and paper two, such as verbs, adverbs and adjectives, noun phrases. You could focus on metaphors, similes, personification, really anything that's um, creating imagery within the text. So any sensory details are useful to, to zoom in on. Um, other methods that are used for emphasis, such as listing and repetition too. And those can cover both fiction and non-fiction, but there might also be some devices that are more specific to paper two for um, writers conveying an, a, a strong viewpoint. So you'll find for paper two, looking at um, rhetorical figures, focusing on things like ethos, logos, and pathos will be useful, um, as well as uh, devices like anecdotes, statistics, things that might be used to back up and support an argument. OK, here's some top tips then for covering uh, both of these questions. Um, number one, it's worthwhile thinking about the number three. Now, when you are looking for quotations um, in these extracts, having three textual details that you can refer to and, and analyse is going to be particularly helpful. Certainly for paper two, question three, you will want to be zooming in on at least three things. Starting your questions as well, your responses, with an overview sentence. I know that's something that we practice quite heavily in class. So um, that's a good starting point to start, you know, from a distance before you zoom in. What is the overall effect? What can you say um, that the writer does? So at least two things. Not only does the writer convey X, but also this as well. So you're setting up an argument for yourself that you can then go on to prove through your analysis. Another top tip is joining paragraphs together. So not making these um, just a set of clunky sentences that don't really link. The more fluent your response, the higher level it's going to be. So using adverbs um, and connectives to join your paragraphs together gluing phrases that build on developing a line of argument, so, such as the writer further enhances the effect of dot 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 by doing this. And those kinds of things then help to push you beyond a very simple response up to the top level, which is described as being perceptive and detailed. So here is a very simplified version of the mark scheme. In fact, you can see this goes up to 12 marks, so it refers actually to paper two, question three, but um, the levels one to four are also used for paper one, two. And just to break it down in a very simplistic way, you can see actually there's three main areas that you can pick up your marks for. One, the comment on the language. So at the lowest level, you're going to make very, very simple comments about language in the text. And we can see by level two, you're attempting to build an argument here. But by level three, your understanding um, and analysis of the language is very clear. OK, it leaves the uh, examiner in no doubt that you've thoroughly understood the text. And to go up to the top band then, perceptive and detailed. So you're being really thorough and precise in your analytical response. We can see a similar thing here happening then for textual details. So making sure you're taking quotations directly from the text and zooming in on specific words and phrases. And also subject terminology. Those labels are important in this question. 
So if we're in doubt, of course we can use terms such as um, this word or the phrase, um, and that's they will absolutely um, be useful to you. However, if you want to get to level three, you need to be clear and accurate, and, and to go higher, sophisticated and accurate, so that you're able to clearly label and explore how um, those methods are used by the writer. Okay, so really what I'm saying here is that these are questions that require you to think hard. Um, so for some students, you have you know been working on these kinds of skills for many years and you you're very confident you can write about this quite naturally for others this is a really challenging um a question and it does take practice and it absolutely is something that you can revise for and give yourself the best possible opportunity um so this is a structure i'm sure you'll be familiar with um, from your lessons. We talk about using what, how and why as a way to guide our thinking about analysing language. So when we're talking about the what, that's our first step. So at this stage you're identifying the methods that the writer uses and what kind of impression they create. Once you've got that, you build on it then by exploring the how. Now the how really is um, the, the most detailed part of your response, okay? So how do the methods that you have picked out of the text convey meaning? Can you zoom in on individual words or phrases in order to explore um, implicit meaning and connotations? You might then create some links to other parts of the text and look at how things work together to create an overall effect. And your final point then is to go further and say, well, why? Why might the writer have chosen these specific words? What do they help me to understand? Do they generate a particular mood, atmosphere? Um, what effect might they have on the reader? What may, might they make the reader think or feel or imagine, for example? And if you're covering those three areas, then you really should be writing at, at least that level three in a clear, um, uh, clear way about language. Okay, so here's a little tip from me. When I am really trying to think about analysing language, um, I don't go straight into the writing. One of the things that um, I do is uh, what we might say is exploding a quotation. So certainly in the revision stages, um, this is a very useful method. Taking a quotation and spending some time uh, exploding it. So writing all around it and trying to say as much as you can about the methods and um, connotations and, and the overall effect. So I'm going to just give you a quick uh, modelled example, example of this and then we'll have a look at uh, a model answer. Okay let's see how well this works. I'm going to be writing straight onto the screen here. Okay so if I look at this quote here, let's give you a bit of context. I've just chosen this one from one of the practice papers that we've done in class. It's actually describing a dinosaur, if you can remember that text. And I'll just read it through. So it says, its mouth gaped, exposing a fence of teeth like daggers. Okay, so I would say that this is a really um, effective quotation to choose because there's lots here within the language that I could zoom in on. So if I just go as a starting point methods, well I could start really simply and think about the nouns. What things are named and therefore um, am I able to kind of picture? So first of all if I just put a circle around them, I've got the mouth, um, the word fence, the teeth and daggers. So it's um, quite a lot of features here um, that form the basis of the imagery. 
Furthermore, if I want to look at methods, well actually the writer makes a comparison and I can see that in the word like here. So I don't just ha have to focus on the nouns, I can look at the use of simile to nouns over here. And in fact, there's at least two verb choices that I could zoom in on also, gaped and exposing. So just in terms of methods, there's quite a lot here that I could talk about. So what impression did they create? Well, overall, I just get the impression that this is a, a huge and terrifying creature, but it is something um, that's incredibly powerful. Okay, and I don't need to go too much beyond that at this stage. I now need to go for the how. Well, how do I know this? Well, let's start with that simile. Um, well, the simile here is looking at teeth like daggers. So let's zoom in on the noun daggers. Well, literally, what is it? Well, a dagger is something sharp, isn't it? It is effectively a, a knife. A weapon. Ooh. And therefore, it has connotations of danger. This is something threatening. It could potentially kill. Um, now let's have a look then to the the noun fence. Well, offensive teeth, that's an interesting word choice to me. They could here have focused on um, using a, an alternative word. They could have used the word row. Okay, so why a fence? Well, a fence is something much larger. So it creates an impression of the scale or the size of this creature. In fact, a fence is like a barrier of some sort, maybe like a protective feature. Um, let's have a look to those verbs then for a moment. Well, if I look for a moment, uh, gaped. Well, if its mouth gaped, that just tells me that it opened widely. And then exposing here, another word for something being exposed is something to be revealed. So I might look at the idea then that as its mouth gaped, its teeth were revealed. So they were suddenly made visible, whether, whereas they weren't before. Okay, so you can just see here how um, my annotations are just helping to shape my thinking um, before I then go on to write about the text. So I need to look at finally then at the why. Well, why do I think these words have been chosen? Why will they have an effect on the reader? Well, ultimately, I think this has a lot to do with um, establishing uh, tension. It seems to be a moment of um, danger, of, of threat, definitely to the characters um, in the text. And so that is something that I can focus on, the idea of increasing tension, through the emphasis on um, threat and danger. And certainly I'm going to think about the atmosphere and I'm going to talk about the characters here too. Okay, plans over. Excuse my terrible writing whilst I'm getting used to writing on screen. Okay, so I recommend again, this is a, a strategy to have a go at. If you don't already do this, spend some time exploding your quotes before you think about writing about them. Okay, so back to the answer uh, then, your answer. Well, in class, I'm sure you would have um, used a, a particular structure to do this. I know we focused on it in lessons. Um, and this is always a really good 
um, starting point. Now over time you'll become more natural at writing in this style and therefore you won't need to you know, use this scaffold quite as heavily um, but in the early stages of practice I find this a really useful method. So the overview sentence always remains the same. We say that through their language choices the writer and we say two things that the writer has done. We then go on to the what stage, so introducing it. Firstly, what does the writer describe? And here you can embed your quote directly into the sentence. What impression does it create? Next, we go on to explore the how. So we zoom in here on a particular word or um, method. We explore the connotations of the language. So we're building up that interpretation, exploring the layers of meaning. And we can go on in that how section as long as we need to before then we finally end up with a why. Why does the writer seem to have done this? What is it perhaps that they are suggesting um, to the reader? And to carry on we can use some of those uh, connectives, we can use some of those gluing phrases anything that's going to help to build up um, a coherent, fluent and detailed response. Okay, so I've got a modelled paragraph here. I wasn't quite brave enough to uh, write in my, with my pen on screen this time around. Um, so I have uh, written this uh, prior to, to creating the video, um, but I'm going to talk you through my thinking process here. So. I've started out here with the what as an example, so I'm going to explain then that what does the writer do? Well, in this case, that they describe the dinosaur close up. It's that close up image um, focusing on the mouth that helps to create the impression that this is a really incredibly powerful and a terrifying creature. Now, I need to prove that through examination of the language. How have I come to that conclusion is what I must stress to the examiner. So I can zoom in. Well, I've chosen first the simile. I think that is perhaps um, one of the most um, significant pieces of imagery in that quotation. So I can explore that. So I'm going to look at how that fence of teeth like daggers, that comparison to daggers, conveying connotations of danger and threat. And then I'm going to go on to just explain that a little bit more, being very clear that I've taken that from the noun daggers, which denotes something sharp, a knife or a weapon, and therefore suggesting that these teeth have the potential to kill. I don't think it's enough to stop there, though. I think that there is enough language within that quotation to be able to zoom in more and build up a more thorough answer. So this time I'm going to focus in on the idea of the uh, noun fence, emphasising the scale and the size of the teeth, creating that huge barrier around its mouth, and how that might also be enhanced by the use of the verb exposing. So here I'm saying that exposing implies the true extent of the dinosaur's power is only revealed and made visible once its mouth gapes and opens widely. So through the how section, I'm being really um, focused on the language, labelling where I need to, and also exploring the, um, the effect. But finally, I want to think about the why. Well, why present the creature in this way? Well, I think this is a moment where the tension has built. It's done, the writer has done that by establishing to us an atmosphere of fear, and at the same time, stressing to the reader that the characters um, in the text are now in a, in a serious and immediate danger. So we can see that that final um, sentence there in the paragraph is going to be really important in enabling me to access higher marks. Okay, so um, there is a separate video to this that really just focuses on the, on the why, because that's often a little bit that um, students find tricky. But I hope that that um, example one is one that you can return back to to um, check your uh, own responses against. OK, so there is question two practice for you to have a go at. Um, this one is taken from paper one, question two. 
so it's worth eight marks. There's a copy of this on the Google site as well for you to um, uh, access and I would recommend that you choose three quotations that you use that exploding quote strategy first and you have a go at writing up using the structure provided. Once you've done that, have a look at the self mark here it gives you some things to um, identify that you've done and used within your own responses. And when you've finished it, I would really uh, recommend that you do some reflection. Well, what would I do differently next time? What did I find particularly tough about this? Um, are there any skills videos um, that I could use to help me uh, uh, improve my response? So um, on that, here's just an example of some of the individual um, focus area uh, sessions I've done. So if word classes is a, are a thing that you struggle with, um, there's a session on that. Equally, one just exploring connotations. Um, as I know, also that's an area some students struggle with. Figurative language, getting to grips with metaphor, simile, personification, um, as well as a video just talking about the effective language and the why section. Um, so those are all available to you to um, dip in and out of as you need to. And I'd recommend that once you've written up your answer, you've self-marked it, if you want some further feedback, um, get in contact with your teachers, send us a copy, and we'll be more than happy to feedback. Okay, thanks for listening. Bye.